Shalom. Toda. And now you know all of my Hebrew. So unfortunately that means I will be speaking in English, but I'll try to go a little bit slow and I hope you can understand that. So thank you all of you for coming out. Obviously thank you to Vegan Friendly for putting on this really fantastic event. All right, so I'm gonna jump right into it. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is psychology <laughs> and social change. What is that, what do I mean? Why does that matter to us as animal advocates? So obviously for many of us who are here uh, this weekend, we're here because we care about animals. We know that this sort of thing is going on in factory farms and slaughterhouses around the world, and we want it to end. And if we think about the changes that we want to bring about, at the end of the day, to create any of these changes, to do any good for farm animals, pretty much all of the things we do, success requires one single thing, and that is changing human behavior. Whether that's changing the decisions of politicians, whether that's changing the decisions of corporate executives, whether that's changing the decisions of individual consumers about what to eat. Success for farm animals requires changing human behavior. By the way, how's the volume? Is this good? Yeah. Good, okay. So, how do we do this? How do we be effective at changing human behavior? Well, there's some things that we as advocates sometimes tell ourselves that sounds good, that feels good, but may not necessarily be true, for example. Sometimes we tell ourselves that we'll succeed because we're on the side of compassion. Or we'll succeed because we really, really care about animals. Or we'll succeed if we just work very, very hard. Now all of these things will make us more likely to succeed, for sure. But if we look around the world today, and if we look back through history, we can see that far too often, those who are on the side of compassion did not win. Those who worked very hard did not necessarily win. So all of these things will help us succeed, but these things alone will not guarantee that we are successful for our animals. So I would suggest to you that we'll succeed if and when we learn about and we use tools that really work from motivating people to change, to change their beliefs, and most importantly, to change their behaviors. Now, thankfully for us, psychology research is really a roadmap. It can be a roadmap for how we can get others to make these compassionate changes that we want them to make. Let me give you an example of this. So there was a study, this was done about 10 years ago in the United States, where some researchers wanted to get uh, homeowners in this one particular neighborhood to start conserving energy for, to protect the environment. And so what they did is they came up with four different brochures. And each brochure just spoke about one reason that homeowners should conserve energy. So the first booklet talked about the environmental reasons to conserve, why it was a good idea. The second booklet talked about the money they could save on their electricity bills by conserving energy. The third booklet spoke about the benefits to the community. And the fourth booklet simply said that many other people in the community were already conserving energy. So they went around to homes in this one particular neighborhood and they left just one of these flyers at each home under each door. And they worked with the local utility company, the local energy company, to monitor the actual energy usage of these homes over the next three months. And I want you to guess which one of these four brochures was most effective at getting people to conserve energy. Who would say the first one, the environmental message? Not a single hand, I don't think. Who would say the second one, you can save money appealing to self-interest? A lot of hands, maybe about a half, two thirds. Third one, benefits to the community. A few? How about the fourth one, other people are doing it? About half, all right. So it turns out that the, there was only one of these booklets that actually was effective at getting people to reduce their energy usage. 
and it was the fourth booklet, the one that said other people are already doing this. Now, this says two things. First of all, it says that we human beings, we're pretty silly, stupid, you know, we do things for irrational reasons. Uh, but secondly, and more importantly, it tells us that if we want to be effective, it's very important not to make our advocacy decisions and our messaging decisions based on philosophies or guesses or assumptions about what's going to work. It's really important to look to the research and what the research says will work. Now, if I was an environmental advocate and I was trying to get people to reduce their energy usage, I think that if I were doing it, I would use the environmental message, right? Or maybe I would try to appeal to people's financial self-interest too. I wouldn't necessarily think about using a message that lots of other people are doing it. And those of us as animal advocates, we may not necessarily be thinking along those lines either. And so this is why it's so important that we look to the research that already exists to teach us how to be more effective. Now, thankfully, there are literally tens of thousands of studies that have already been done by researchers and academics around the world. And they're published. You can go online, you can go to your local library and read them. And maybe for some of you, spending a Thursday night or a Friday night reading through thousands of studies is your idea of a, a fun weekend. But I imagine for many of us, this is a bit of a scary proposition. So rather than have to go through and read all the boring studies yourself, I've tried to summarize some of the more important ones in my book, Change of Heart, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to share a few specific tools that every one of us can use in our advocacy work, in our conversations with friends, with family, to be more effective, to be more persuasive. So, I'm gonna get right into that now. So the first tool I wanna to talk about is stories versus statistics. Okay, so this number is from the United States, but if I was trying to advocate for farm animals, if we are trying to advocate for farm animals, what is likely to be more effective? Telling a story about an individual animal and what life is like for her on a factory farm, or sharing statistics about the number of animals that suffer, or the amount of environmental harm caused, or the health benefits of moving towards vegan eating. Well, some researchers wanted to put this question to the test. Now, they were not animal advocates, but they decided to look at another also very important topic, the topic of starvation in Africa. And so what they did is they created three different fundraising letters, and they sent them to three different audiences. So the first letter spoke about how big the problem was. It gave statistics about the number of people starving to death each year, the number displaced by war and famine, and so forth. The second letter didn't have any of that. All it had is a story of one young girl and what life was like for her as a child facing and struggling with starvation. And the third letter had both of those. So it had the facts about how big the problem was and how many were suffering, but it also had the story of this one young girl. So the letters went out, donations came back in as people read these letters. And which of these three letters do you think was most effective? Which do you think raised the most money to actually fight starvation? So who would say the first one, the one with the statistics? Of course, nobody. Who would say the second one, the one with just the story? Maybe half, a third? And who would say the third one, the one with both the story and the statistics? About another half. All right, so it turned out that one of these three letters generated twice as much money to fight starvation as the other two. And it was the second letter, the one that only had the story. In fact, the letter that had both the story and the statistics did only slightly better than the statistics only letter. Let me give you one other example of this. There was a researcher who was also a professor at a university, and he had all of the students in his class design and give a presentation to the class about a subject of their choosing, whatever they wanted to talk about. At the end of the class, after all the presentations were done and some time had passed, he polled the students to see what they remembered 
from one another's lectures earlier that day. And what he found is that for the statistics and the facts that were presented, they remember, the other students remembered only about 5% of those facts. But for the stories presented that day, they remembered about 60% of the stories. Stories are inherently sticky. We remember them, they have the ability to influence us emotionally, to influence our thinking, and to influence our behavior. So what does all this mean for us as animal advocates? It means that as we're advocating for farm animals and encouraging people to change their diets, it can be very tempting to talk about the number of animals that suffer, the quantities of environmental harm or health benefits you could have by moving toward vegan eating. But what the research suggests is that we will be significantly more effective at getting people to actually change by focusing on a story or stories about individual animals and their experiences on factory farms. Okay, so I'm going to move on now to the next tool, and that is the best request. Now, most of us want the most we can get out of life, right? We want to have a lot of fun, we want to do good, meaningful work, we want to have great times with our loved ones, family, and friends. And when it comes to advocacy, we all want as much as we can get for animals. So in an ideal world, every other person in Israel, every other person around the world would not only go vegan, of course, immediately, but become a full-time vegan advocate until the rest of the world goes vegan, right? This is ideally what we'd want, and probably we'd want them to do all sorts of other things as well. For some of that, us, maybe that's live, uh, you know, not drive, or do other things to protect the environment. For others, it might be something else. Long story short, there's lots of things that we ideally would like everyone else to do, changes we'd like everyone else to make. But the question for us as advocates is, how much of that should we ask for? Should we ask for something small that's easy for them to do, but may not create a whole lot of change? Should we ask for everything that we want, knowing that they may not do everything, but if we make clear what we think they should do, they'll do as much as we can get them to make? Or should we ask for something in the middle? Well, this was a question that a number of researchers have also asked and also done studies around to try to find out the answer. And what they found is this. They found that when it comes to messages being persuasive at getting people to make changes in their lifestyle, there's this kind of curve that, on average, is followed in terms of what's most effective. And this is what it looks like. So asking people to make very simple changes does get people to make changes, but it, again, it doesn't lead to a lot of change, so it's not that great. Asking people to do something very difficult leads very few people to make that change. The type of message that, on average, seems to be most effective is what you see highlighted there. Asking people to make a change that is significant, but that they could probably picture themselves doing. Something that is not so difficult that they just couldn't imagine doing that themselves. So what does this mean for us as animal advocates? What is the message that hits that sweet spot of being a meaningful, significant change, but one that many people could at least picture themselves doing? Well, there's been several studies now, three or four studies that have been done that looked at for those of us doing diet change advocacy, for those of us who want other people to go vegan, what is the message that generates the most behavior change, the most reduction in consumption of animal products? So there's three or four studies done, and every single one of those studies, well, this is not conclusive, this is not proven yet, but each of those studies found the same results, and it's results that match the research in behavior change in, in general. And that is that these kind of in-between messages, messages like reducing meat consumption or messaging like cut out on or cut, cut out or cut back on animal products, those messages have consistently led to more reduction in animal product consumption than go vegan or even go vegetarian type messaging. So something for all of us to keep in mind as we think about the conversations we have with family, with friends, and with the general public. 
All right, so next tool I want to talk about is called foot in the door. And this one might be fairly understandable just from the title alone. So there's some researchers uh, in the state of California in the United States, and they had a goal. Their goal is they wanted to get people who live in a certain community to put up these kind of ugly yard signs out in their front yard that said, drive safely basically with a goal of protecting the kids who played in the streets of this community. So they went around from door to door and they knocked on doors and they said, hi, my name is Nick, I'm, uh, I live in the area. We're trying to get, uh, we're trying to promote safety in the community, we're trying to protect our children, and we wondered if you would put this yard sign out in your front yard. But because the signs were not very attractive and these were strangers, not many people did. Only about 15%, one out of every seven or so people, said, sure, I'll put out the yard sign. So researchers, researchers then went to other homes in the exact same community, knocked on doors, introduced themselves, but this time they left those yard signs in the car and instead they brought with them these little three inch by three inch, like seven centimeter by seven centimeter, these little window stickers that said drive safely and they asked them to put these tiny little window stickers up in their front window. This was a much easier thing for people to do. It was small, it was, you wouldn't really see it, it wasn't visible from the street. So because it was an easier request, almost everyone agreed to and did put the little stickers up in their window. Now, three weeks later, researchers went back to these, those same homes that got the window stickers knocked on doors, said, hi, it's me again, thanks again for putting out that window sticker, and now we wondered if you would put this yard sign out in your front yard. And this time, not 15%, but 70% agreed to and did put the yard signs out in their front yard. In other words, even though the ultimate goal of researchers was to get these yard signs out in people's front yards, they were much more effective at doing it by first making a similar but easier request that people said yes to, waiting for a little time to pass, and then going back and making their second real larger request. And there are literally over a thousand studies done in countries around the world that have documented the power of this so-called foot-in-the-door approach. So just to give you a couple other quick examples, Another study found that people who were asked to sign a petition to support the building of a recreation center for the physically handicapped, the next week donated twice as much money to build that facility as people who were never even asked to sign a petition in the first place. Similarly, on one college campus, people who were given a little pin to promote the Canadian Cancer Society, the next week, again donated about twice as much money to the Canadian Cancer Society as people who were not given the pin. Now why would this be the case? Why would putting up a little window sticker, signing a petition, wearing a tiny pin, why would these lead us to make more significant behavior changes like donating or volunteering or anything else? Well researchers think that the reason this works is because it shifts our sense of self-identity. So I may have never heard of the Canadian Cancer Society, and I may not care about cancer, but if somebody gives me a little pin and says, hey, would you put on this pin to show your support, I'll probably be nice and say, sure, happy, happy to do it, I'll stick it on. And once I've done that, I start to, subconsciously at least, think of myself as, oh, I must be a person who cares about fighting cancer, otherwise, why would I have put on this pin? Right? And so now that we start thinking of ourselves in that way, when we are asked to do something larger, like donate, or volunteer, or change our diet, or anything else, we are much more likely to do that, because it's in line with how we are starting to see ourselves. And that is why getting people to make small changes is a fantastic way, and oftentimes a more effective way, to get them to make larger changes. And that's one reason why Initiatives like the Meatless Monday initiative can do a lot of good, not only by getting institutions to reduce the amount of meat they use and other animal products, 
But by getting people to make a change that is doable, that they could picture themselves <laughs> doing, that sets them up to be more likely to make larger behavior changes down the line. And indeed, while again, this is not conclusive, and we don't know this for sure, the one or two studies that have looked at this have found that people who have started reducing the meat consumption, who are doing Meatless Monday or Reducitarian or other things along those lines, they are significantly more likely to go vegan than people who have not made those smaller changes. Okay, so the next tool I wanna to talk about is commitment. Commitment is a tool that we probably already sometimes use in our own lives without even thinking about it. And rather than describing it, let me just get into a couple more studies from the research. Okay, so there was a restaurant. It was a, a very high-end, expensive restaurant, and it was doing really well. It was packed, they were selling out, they were getting reservations for weeks, sometimes months ahead of time. So they were doing really well. But they had one problem. The problem was that a lot of people would make reservations, but then on the night of the reservation, they wouldn't show up. And this meant empty tables, and this meant money lost for the restaurant. So what they did is, working with researchers, they decided to make one small change when taking the reservations. And that is, at the end of the phone call, after they had put the reservation in place, they asked the person on the other end of the line, hey, if you change your plans and you're not coming, will you call us and let us know? Asking this one simple question and waiting for people to say, sure, happy to do that, reduced the no-show rate from 30% down to 10%. Took almost no time, took no money, and it dramatically reduced the no-show rate, dramatically increased the profits of this restaurant. An example of this from the nonprofit policy side is with the American Red Cross, which does blood collection drives on college campuses across the country every year. And so one year, they were looking at things they could do to get more students to come out and donate blood. And they tried something similar. When they were calling students on campus to let them know about the upcoming drive, they made this one change. At the end of the call, they asked the students, so can we count on seeing you there tomorrow? And they waited for the person to say, yeah, I'll be there. Or, of course, for some of them, no, I can't make it. Asking that one simple question, waiting for a response, doubled the number of students who showed up to donate blood the next day. And here's one final example uh, from the research. So there were some researchers who were trying to encourage people to take public transportation, which in the United States, uh, maybe here in Israel as well, but especially in the US, is a big challenge. People don't like taking it, they don't want to take it, but of course, it's better for the environment. And so researchers were trying to figure out, what can we do that will make people more likely to get on city buses and use buses instead of driving wherever they need to go. So they tried four different approaches. For one group of people, they just gave them information. Information about why it was good to take public transportation and how to take it, like a bus map of the city and timetables and so on. Second group of people was asked to make a verbal commitment to ride the bus more often. A third group was given 10 free bus tickets and told that once they used those up, they would be able to get more free bus tickets. And the fourth group was both given the free tickets and asked to make the verbal commitment. The researchers then tracked how much of these people actually rode the buses over the next few months. And again, let's take a little poll here. Which one of these four approaches do you think was most effective at getting people to actually ride buses. So, who's gonna say the first one, the information only? Of course, no hands. How about the second one, the verbal commitment? A few hands, maybe a third, a quarter. The third one, the 10 free bus tickets. All right, about another third. And how about the last one, the free tickets and the hand? Okay, actually, that's, that's a lot. So it turns out that of these four approaches, there were two that were tied as a most effective approach. And that was the two that involved the verbal commitment, the second and the fourth. They both got more people to ride the bus and they got people to ride the bus in equal amounts. 
And so what that tells us is that the free tickets actually did nothing at all. But the verbal commitment got people on buses. So what does that tell us as advocates, as animal advocates? Well, sorry. Uh, what does it tell us as animal advocates? It tells us that you know, often we are so focused on giving people information about why they should go ahead and change their diet. But here's one nice little thing we can add on. Takes 10 seconds, takes no extra money that will make people more likely to make the diet changes we would like them to make. Asking them to make a verbal commitment or a written commitment or a public commitment, any of these things are shown to make people more likely to follow through and make the changes that we want them to make. Okay. Next tool I want to talk about is called social norms. You know, many of us like to think of ourselves as these kind of bold, independent creatures, we do what we want, and we believe what we believe, and we live the way we want to live. But the reality is that at heart, most of us are copycats. We do what other people are doing, either society in general, or at least people in our social and peer group. We just copy what other people are doing, for the most part. And this can be a powerful motivator for behavior change. We saw this earlier in the study about trying to get homeowners to reduce their energy usage. And I want to give you one other example of how using a so-called social norms message, a message that basically says, hey, lots of other people are doing this thing, you should do it too. Another example from the research at just how powerful this tool can be. So there, were, there, were, uh, there was a hotel, a major hotel chain, that wanted their guests to start reusing bath towels. In other words, use the same towel every night rather than asking for a fresh, clean towel every night. Now, really, their main motivation was financial. If people wanted a new towel every night, that was more laundry to do. So more staff time, more energy costs, more water to run the washers and the dryers. But of course, it would also be good for the environment if people reuse their towels. And so what they did is they put up a little sign in every room in the hotel that basically said, we're trying to protect the environment and we'd love your help, so if you could reuse your bathhouse, that would be great. That'd be great for the environment. And this did work to some extent. Some people did start reusing their bathhouse, but researchers thought that they could do a bit of a better job. And so they teamed up with the hotel and they went around <clears throat> to every room in this hotel and they took out those signs threw them in the trash, and they put in new signs that said nothing about protecting the environment at all. All these new signs said was, most guests in this hotel <laughs> reuse their bath towels. <laughs> and switching from the environmental message to the social norms message, increased towel use, towel reuse by about 25%. And when the researchers went back and made those signs even more specific, and said most guests in room 309, or whatever room it was, reused their towels, you guessed it, towel reuse increased further still. We really are very weird creatures, aren't we human beings? So again, what this tells us is that we advocates are often so focused on why people should make this change, the ethical reasons, or the health reasons, or whatever, whatever other reasons. But adding in a social norms message talking about and giving the sense that lots of other people are making this change can be really effective. And this has been shown in all sorts of fields. So, for example, from the environmental field, studies on conserving water, on conserving energy, on not littering, on recycling. In all of these areas, social norms messages have consistently been more effective than cause-based or ethical messages at getting people to actually make the good environmentally friendly behavior change. So, the more that we as advocates can make vegan eating look like the new trend, look like a cool thing to do, look like something that more and more people and celebrities are doing, the more persuasive we will be. And here's one last little thing, and I, this is the first time I've ever included it in a talk about this because it's new research, but there's some new research showing that using what's called a dynamic social norms message is even more effective. And what this means is that, okay, if we say lots of people are doing this, that's good. 
But even more effective is saying more and more people are doing this. So making it seem like this is a growing trend is actually the most effective way, at least for vegan eating, to, uh, to use a so-called social norms message. All right, so next tool I want to talk about, I have just this and I think one more uh, after this, and that is be like them. So from the last few studies, we've looked at how we are very motivated to change our behavior and our beliefs based on what others are doing. Well, here's another implication of that for us as advocates. Because we are more likely to copy and imitate people who uh, are similar to us, this, this should impact how we go about, go about our advocacy. So there's studies on all sorts of issues showing that if a person smokes and you smoke, you're more likely to listen to, to them and do what they suggest. If a person is a certain religion and you're the same religion, you're more likely to do what they suggest. If you're the same gender, if you're in the same age group, if you're in the same economic group, if you have the same style of clothing, all of these similarities make people more likely to listen to you, to do what you're encouraging, or just to do whatever it is that you're doing. So what this means for us as animal advocates is that the more we can adapt ourselves to look like and sound like and seem like our audience, the more likely we are to persuade them to make the changes that we want them to make. So if we're doing outreach at a you know, music, outdoor punk music festival or something like that, we may want to dress and look and speak a certain way. And if we're doing it at a conference of conservative business leaders, we may want to dress and look and speak in a different way. Adapting ourselves and our body language and posture and even our messaging to our audience so that we make it look like, hey, I'm just like you, but I'm vegan. That will make them much more likely to think, oh, maybe I should do the same thing. More likely to listen to us, more likely to make these same behavior changes. Lastly, show them how. Because all of us care so much about the suffering of animals, and for many of us because we know the health benefits people can have from moving to vegan eating, we often focus much of our messaging and much of our conversations around why. Why people should make these diet changes. And we don't spend nearly as much time talking about how. How can they actually go about making these changes that we would like them to make? And I think that's very understandable. For one thing, like I said, we care very passionately. We know how animals are suffering, we know how horrible that is, and we want it to stop. And another reason I think this happens is because for most of us, we've been eating vegan for a long time. Maybe that's a few months. For many of us, it's a few years or many years. And I think that, uh, like anything, once we've been doing something for a while, it can seem very easy to us. And we forget that it doesn't seem quite so easy to someone who has never done that thing before, right? But it's really important to show people how to make these changes. In fact, a so-called meta-analysis, an analysis of 200 other studies on diet and lifestyle changes, found that the biggest determining factor and whether or not someone will actually make a change in how they eat or how they live isn't whether they think it's a good thing to do. That matters. People who think something is a good thing are, of course, more likely to do that thing. But the most important determining factor was not whether they thought it was good, but whether they felt they had the ability to make that change. So while we do want to show people and tell people why to make these changes, it's just as, if not more important, to show them how, how they can do it. And when it comes to moving towards vegan eating, the research shows there are four main barriers that the meat and egg and dairy consuming public view as the barriers to going or staying vegan. And here they are. So, the biggest issue is taste. On study after study after study, the number one reason people cite for not going vegan or not going vegetarian or for going back to eating meat is taste. They don't want to give up the taste of meat or they miss the taste of meat or they think vegan food doesn't taste good or won't taste good. The second biggest concern is health. 
People worry that they will not be healthy or they don't feel healthy once they make this switch. And the biggest health concern, which of course all of us have heard a million times, is getting enough protein. That is, the research shows, and our experience all shows, the biggest uh, mental barrier people perceive around health. Third biggest issue, convenience. People feel like they don't know where to buy vegan food, how to cook it. They don't know what restaurants they could go to and what they could order if they go to those restaurants. And fourth and finally, social issues. People worry that if they do go vegan, that they may not fit in with their friends anymore. Their family dinners might be uncomfortable or a bit awkward, and this can, can put them off. So these are the four biggest barriers that people face. And so the more that we can show people how to navigate these challenges, how to find really delicious vegan food, how to be healthy while eating this way, how it can be convenient and easy, how to make it simple uh, when hanging out with friends and family, the more we can pe help people overcome these how barriers, the more likely they are to actually make these changes. And this is really important, not just for getting people to change and to move toward vegan eating, but for getting them to stick with it. Uh, because I don't know the statistics for Israel, but for Europe and for the United States, three out of every four people that go vegetarian go back to eating meat. And for vegans, the numbers are only slightly better than that. There's still an almost equally high recidivism rate. And so to get people to make these changes, but also crucially to get them to stick with them, we need to show people the hows of doing it. Now, I'm almost done, but before I wrap up and we have time for a few questions, I want to chat for just a few minutes about our own psychology. So I've been up here talking about how other people's minds work or how our minds work so that we can more effectively persuade other people, get them to listen, get them to care, get them to make a change. And that's important. But perhaps even more important than understanding other people's psychology and the psychology that influences their food choices is understanding our own psychology and how it can either help or hurt our efforts to make the world a better place for farm animals. So, the first is, it can be challenging to face ourselves and to face our own motivations for doing the things that we do for farm animals. For all of us who are here today, here this weekend, there's probably a number of reasons that we're here. Sure, caring about animals is clearly one of those reasons, or caring about the health of the environment. But there's also other reasons that we're here. And there's also other reasons that we volunteer, that we do other things that can help farm animals. For example, we do these things because we like to be ourselves. We like to express ourselves and express our own beliefs. It feels good to stand up for what we believe in. It feels good to tell other people, hey, here's who I am, here's what I believe, here's why I think you should do this too. It feels good. We all like to do it. Many of us like to do it. We may have the motivation of wanting to have fun, right? It's fun. It's frankly fun to be at an event like this, try lots of cool new vegan food, see new vegan companies, connect with people we're friends with or becoming friends with, to be around like-minded people. It's just, it's fun. And lastly, it helps us feel good. It makes us feel good to be a part of something that feels meaningful and that is in line with what we really deeply believe about society and about how society should be. It makes life feel more meaningful. Now, all of these personal motivations, the motivation to express our beliefs, to be ourself, to feel good, to have fun, these are all good, valid things that we can and should desire in life. Right? We should desire all these things. They're good, they're healthy, they're natural. But we also have to be honest with ourselves about the fact that sometimes these personal motivations for doing animal advocacy, they can conflict with our other motivation. And that motivation of doing what works best for helping farmed animals. And I want to give a couple examples of that. Okay, so... Imagine that there was a guy who on sun, Sunday or Monday was going to be going into a high school uh, somewhere here in Tel Aviv. 
<clears throat> and talking to an assembly of high school students about why they might want to move towards vegan eating too, why they might want to care about farm animals. Which of these two guys that I'm about to show you do you think is going to be more effective at getting these students to listen, to care, and to change their diets? Which one do you think is going to be more effective? The me from about 15 years ago on the left? Yes, that is me. Or the me from today, or a few years ago. Really? Do you think I should go back to the dreadlocks? Is that what the applause is? <clears throat> we all know that unless this presentation was to a very certain type of audience, for 99% of the public, it's simply the fact that one physical appearance is going to be help a person be more effective than another physical appearance. That's not good, right? It'd be great if the world did not work that way. But that is the way that most people work, and that means that if we have an appearance that's very different from our audience, we're fighting not one battle, the battle to get them to care about animals, but we're fighting two. And that makes it statistically much less likely that they will make the changes that we want them to make. So although it feels good to express ourselves and how we dress and how we do our hair and all those things, the sacrifice of giving that up, of changing, is nothing compared to the benefit it has for countless animals. So that's one, that's one example. Here's another example. Let's say that you're out on the street volunteering for Vegan Friendly, Anonymous, any organization, you're having a conversation with a member of the public, and somebody stops to chat, and they're not on board yet, you know, they're not vegan, they're not like one of us, but they are open to having a conversation about it. As we start to have that conversation, what is going on in the back of our mind? In the back of our mind, are we thinking, I need to tell this person about how baby male chicks are ground up alive and about how animals are confined in cages so small they can't turn around. I need to tell them about the environmental argument and how if they want to stop climate change, they have to go vegan or they can't be an environmentalist. I need to tell them that they're going to live five years longer if they go vegan. Is that what's in the back of our mind? How to win the argument? Or in the back of our mind, are we thinking, okay, who's this person standing in front of me what do they seem to be like? What kind of person do they seem to be? What seems to be their motivations for how they think about life and make decisions? Who is this person? And what can I say that's gonna be most likely to get them to do what I would like them to do? Not what's gonna show that I'm right. Not what's gonna show that I know more than them. Not what's gonna win the argument. But what can I say that's gonna be most likely to get them to do what I would like them to do. For those of you who were here last night, there were some great comments from Joey about a few things, like asking them questions, or making a joke. There's all sorts of things we can do to make people more likely to do what we want them to do. And often, that motivation to express ourselves, to express what we believe and what we know, can be at odds with the thing we could say and the thing we could do that is most likely to get somebody to actually change. Lastly, in our choice of activity, we all know that there is a thousand and one things that we could do that all would do good for animals. There's so many different activities and programs and causes we could engage on. So how do we pick? Do we do the thing that our friends are doing? Do we do the things that the group we're most familiar with is doing? Do we work on issues that happen to be in the media or happen to be all over social media right now? Do you do the things that were fun, that are fun? Or do we honestly, you know, kind of take a mental step back and think of all the different things I could do to help animals? Of all the different things that do help animals? Which one can I do that's going to help the most animals? That's going to reduce the most animal suffering? All of us who are here today our motivation, or one of our motivations, is we want to do good. Every one of us starts from a place of, I want to do good for farm animals. But as we go on, the question we need to ask ourselves, every day, every week, every month, every year, is not just how can I do good, but how can I do the most good? How can I help the most animals reduce the most animal suffering? 
In the United States, in English, uh, we have a saying called, an uh, expression called the bottom line. Maybe you have something similar in Hebrew. And it basically means that for for profit companies, the Adidas's of the world, the meat companies of the world, every single for profit company has a bottom line. And that is their ultimate goal. And their goal is to make money. And every decision they make, what to sell, how to market it, who to advertise to, what stores to go into, or where to locate their stores. Every one of those decisions is made with an eye toward the bottom line. If it's gonna make them more money, they do it. If it's not gonna make them as much money, they don't do it. Those of us who are advocates for farm animals, we have a bottom line as well. Now our bottom line is, of course, not dollars and cents, but I would submit to you our bottom line is again, saving the greatest number of animals and reducing the greatest amount of animal suffering as we can with the short time that we have to live and with the limited amount of money and resources that each of us has. The more we focus on this bottom line of doing the most good, the more we pay attention to our own psychology and our own motivations about why we're doing one thing and not the other and what we could be doing the more effective we will be at sparing hundreds, thousands, even millions of animals from a lifetime of intense suffering. That's it for me. Obviously for anyone who is interested in reading more about psychology research and how it can make you more effective, I talk about a number of other tools um, in that book. So again, thank you all for coming out. Thank you for the work.